everyone. Thank you for joining us online here at Destiny. If you haven't had a chance to visit our campus, we would love for you to come out to either our 9.30 or 11.30 service on Sunday. But if you can't, you can always watch us online here at destinyokc.com. And while you're there, you can look up any past messages, see any of our upcoming events, and read pastor's blogs. Also, be sure to follow us on social media right here. And now, here's this week's message. All right, man, the Lord is just preparing an atmosphere for us today. Do you agree? I just sent something in worship that, um, just a real open heaven that we want. And I really, I just feel so stirred with what I've been praying about and asking the Lord to give me wisdom with. We're talking about these five weeks of five things that really are the most transformational revelations God has ever entrusted to our care. And just during worship, I just felt the Lord say, this is to be a book. So I really believe that our church uh, is to be an expression of transformation to our world. And so uh, I'm going to begin to pray about that and cultivate that, and, and uh, many of you are stories in this as we've been talking each week, and so I may be inviting you to share your story on a little more pronounced uh, level, but why don't we just, you know, God's always thinking something beyond what we are, so why don't we just uh, invite him to really have a conversation and speak to our hearts today, make a, a rich deposit of his word that will awaken something very purposeful in our lives. So Holy Spirit... I thank you uh, that none of us gather to impress each other. We certainly know we cannot gather to impress you. But Lord, we just desire to know you and to make you known, to grow in our relationship with you and grow in our relationship with God's family. And I pray you would deepen that understanding within us today. We just prepare our hearts to receive, Lord, all you desire to deposit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I, I just want to start by reading some scripture and kind of praying scripture. I think it's really healthy for us not just to read our Bibles like the you know, religious thing to do, but actually interact with the author when we're, di when we're digging into the book. And um, this is a verse, portion of scripture that I pray over you as a congregation more than any other portion of scripture. And I pray for you routinely. I pray for you daily uh, as a part of what God's asked me to do as a pastor but I just want to declare this over you out of Ephesians 1, 17, because it very much aligns with where we're going to go today. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And Lord, I pray you give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may know you better, that we would walk in intimacy with you in the name of Jesus. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the age to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Lord, we know that you've awakened something within our hearts, not just to be a gathering of the church, but to be the movement of Christ for our generation where you are filling everything in every way with your presence through the body of Christ. As we learn more about our function together, Lord, I know that will be awakened in a greater reality. In Jesus' name, do it for us today, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So the title today is Relationally Enriched. I hope you got a note card coming in. They're by the communion stations at the back uh, if you want to grab one. <clears throat> but Relationally Enriched. And it's just an insight and a perspective that has helped us understand a little more 
of what um, God's desiring from us in terms of true community. And I watched this documentary once. Maybe you've seen it. It's a McDonald's documentary where a guy set out to eat McDonald's food for 30 days. When he wanted breakfast, he went to McDonald's. When he went to lunch, he went to McDonald's. When he went to dinner, he went to McDonald's. How many of you think that's McCrazy? Uh, you might even say it's McStupid. And so in this journey, he did it under the care of a physician to make sure that he was okay. And about two weeks in, I think it was actually less than that, maybe 12 days, he started having uh, organ failure. Things in his body started shutting down. Uh, the doctor said to him, you cannot continue on this journey or you're going to die. And as I watched this documentary, I thought of a few things. <laughs> as you probably are right now too. No, no bash to McDonald's, you know, their pursuit of profitability uh, is their main emphasis, not the nutritional value they're trying to contribute to society. So you need to recognize that. But this is one thing that I thought about as I reflected on that. You can actually, in the society that you and I live, you can actually have food in your stomach and no nutrition in your body, even though you have food in your stomach. There's no nutritional value to certain food that you can put in your... In other words, you can have food in your stomach and still be malnourished. And as I thought about the parallel of that, not only can you in our society have food in your stomach and still be malnourished... Somebody needs to fix that. I'm going to kill myself. I don't know. <clears throat> uh, not only can you have food in your stomach and still be malnourished... You can be surrounded by crowds of people and be relationally malnourished at the same time. Because it's not just about people. It's not just about friends. You know, Facebook, man, we've got so many friends. What is friend? You know, what, what even is that anymore in the society in which you and I live? And what's happened is we've kind of extracted relational value out of the connections and the people, and we don't even understand true communion Connection, community, communication, all those words are born out of communion. C communion. Community is an important word for us to understand today. Uh, last week, A.T. mentioned uh, in referencing the, as the director of our, in, of our Leadership Institute, week two, by the way, tonight, 5.30, uh, those classes or that class will begin. Uh, but he mentioned last week, you know, when, when furniture comes in a box, it is gathered in a box but does not serve the purpose until it is actually assembled together on purpose. If you ever had to put together a piece of furniture, you know exactly what he's talking about. Just because it's gathered in a box doesn't mean it's serving any purpose. Until you assemble it for its purpose, then it will not serve its purpose. And just because people, the church, the body of Christ, gathers in the box of this building doesn't mean we're serving our purpose. Anybody hearing me today? We must be assembled together on purpose, connected on a deeper level than just, hi, how are you? Fine, that's a lie. Just keep moving on. Don't really want to have a deep conversation today. Very important that we get deeper than that. Very important that we understand what true relationship is really all about. This is why you and I are created in the image of community God. I want you to think about this. God is a trinity. He is community in and of himself. Community is rooted in his very nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity reveals God is this community of love, communication, affection, and respect. You and I are created in the image of community God. Therefore, we are created in the image of community. We are created for community. And outside of true community, you are going to suffer relational malnourishment and not become everything God has called you to become. It is not good for man to be alone. Come on, help me clap that in. We're just declaring that today. God's helping us be awakened. You know what a great marriage is? It's a marriage with true community. I was reluctant to go into this because it's a little bit elaborate, but I just felt the Lord reminding me again this morning, so I'm going to I'm going to explain something to you. In the, in, the, in the New Testament, the Bible references, it's a Greek language translated to English for us, uh, but in, in, the, in the New Testament, the Bible references when a man unites himself with a prostitute, and it's the word kaleos. It's the Greek word kaleos, 
And it resembles the same word used when the Bible says in the New Testament, man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. It's a resembling word to that, but it's not koleos, it's proskoleos when it's brought into the context of marriage. You know what the difference is? There's a prefix, and the prefix means that we're taking it to a higher revelation of community. That's literally what this is talking about. Kaleos, a man uniting himself with a prostitute, a person involved in pornography, a person involved in adultery, a person involved in fornication, a person involved in sexual gratification and sexual sin, always references the word kaleos. That's also the word that, that's used to reference animals that are reproducing. So literally, reducing yourself to a sexual experience or a sexual expression that's not brought into the context of the covenant of marriage reduces you to an animalistic, opportunistic expression, and you do not even understand what God is trying to do between two people, husband and wife, leave and cleave that proskaleo. Come on, God wants us to understand a revelation of community on every level of life, love, and happiness. It's vital for us to understand a great family is a family that gets around the table and has conversation and actually is deep interaction. It's community, a family with community. A great church is not a church that has a polished product of worship and teaching. A great church is a church that has deep sense of community because we're born in the image of community God. Your life is going to suffer deficiency and dysfunction if you do not understand what I'm talking about. You will not only suffer it for yourself, but you will perpetuate it in the generation after you. Your kids won't have a devotion to the true sense of community that God has called them to have if you do not possess that and perpetuate that out of your own priorities of life. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. You ought to be shouting. Sunday, September the 8th, we're having a Discovering Destiny reception. We want to help you go deeper in the sense of community. It is Sunday, September 8th. It'll be immediately following the first service. If you're a second service attender, you'll need to come early that day. It'll be at 11 o'clock, and we're going to meet in the upstairs on that side of the building, right in the middle of the, of the floor, and be talking to you about what God's plan is for you in terms of connection. We want to introduce you in that morning to a five-week focus of a community group. I'm so thankful for all of our community groups. And, you know, a couple times a year we do this, uh, this focus where everybody's able to, to see out on all the tables all the various groups that are meeting. And I just want to say thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, to all of our group leaders who've shown up early, going to stay late, be here for the training luncheon this afternoon. Some of you then back for the Leadership Institute this evening. Can you just help me? Let's say a big thanks to all of our group leaders who've worked so hard, serve our church family from their heart, pastoring, loving, and encouraging. I'm so thankful. So what we have hoped is that people will drift into a community group that's right for them so that they can grow in a sense of relational connectivity as a church. But what we've decided is that's kind of a hope without a strategy because hope is not a strategy. We're hoping people will find. So what we're going to do, we're going to take that Discovering Destiny on September the 8th and introduce, starting on Wednesday, September the 11th, we're going to do a five-week Discover Destiny community group where you're going to walk through with an understanding. Uh, I promise you these five weeks will actually help you in your vocation, in your career, in your relationships. It'll be empowering for you personally. You'll also learn a little bit about how we function as a church, which groups we have available, and after five weeks, it's over. After five weeks, it's done. In the conclusion of those five weeks, you will be empowered to know which community group is a good fit for me, my family, if you have a family scenario, or if you're single, however that looks, will help you know which group to go to, whether you go to that group or not is, is really up to you. But we want to be intentional about helping people build relationship because community is more than a preference, it's a conviction in this house. You and I live, it's your, next, it's your blank to fill in, you and I live in a world that is overcommitted and underconnected. How many of you agree with that? We are overcommitted in every direction, underconnected in almost every relationship, and we must beware of the barrenness of a busy life. Busy lives are barren 
grounds. And we have to be very careful if we're not investing in true community connection and relationship on a deeper sense of, of uh, a deeper level, then we're, we're lacking something that is very central in the very heart of God. I read this article, and I reference it from time to time, um, and it just really helped me understand ministry. It was so simple, and, and most of you have heard it, but, but some of you have not. And it's, it basically talked about the three favorite phrases people love to hear all over the world. This wasn't in the U.S. This is all over the world. The three most favorite phrases. Number one, I love you. Go ahead, just tell somebody, say, I love you. Give them some love. I love you. Everybody loves to hear, I love you. All over the world, people love to hear, I love you. Now, if you're sitting by yourself and you're not with somebody, you just didn't get any love. You need to sit by somebody, you need communion. I don't want you having deficiency. I love you. And then the second thing people love to hear you say, you're forgiven. Aren't you glad for grace and forgiveness? I stand here in front of my wife giving thanks for our marriage now of 29 years with much forgiveness that she has provided me over the years. Can anybody relate? I love you. You're forgiven. Here's the third phrase, third thing people love to hear us say, I love you. You're forgiven. Let's eat. Let's eat. It ought to say hashtag America after that, in my opinion, but I love you, you're forgiven, let's eat. For God so loved the world, he sent his son to forgive the world. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. I love you, you're forgiven, let's eat. You want to understand real ministry? I love you, you're forgiven, let's eat. Reaching into people's lives in a deeper sense of community, I care about you, I love you. You're forgiven. There's grace. Let's eat. Let's take some time around a table and talk about the things that really matter. That's ministry. That's ministry. The table. The table of the Lord. Isn't it interesting that in the holy place, you know, we went through the tabernacle and, and we looked at what the temple was and, and not, not too long ago. We had that evening of prayer. You came through the tabernacle components as you came in for worship and prayer. It was a really great evening. But if you remember, we went into the holy place and there were these different articles of furniture. And you remember in the holy place of God, there's a table. Isn't it amazing that God chose to put a table in the holy place, in the temple of the Lord, to communicate the sacred value of that which may seem so common? Well, the studies and research are profound of the impact of a dinner table, a meal table with a family on a weekly basis. Just that focus of coming together around the, something so common. Listen, folks, it is absolutely sacred to understand the value of the table in your life. You, you do realize the best portion of your life, is, it's not the great vacation moments. I, I, I enjoy getting away. But the best portion of your life will be seemingly insignificant moments spent smiling with people who matter to you the most. And what we've done in our society is bought into this commercialized conclusion that we have to go somewhere awesome to have a good time when actually the deeper, more meaningful moments in life happen in intimate terms of just enjoying each other. But that doesn't sell well, and, and companies can't be built on that very well, and their profitability wanes when we figure all that out. So you got to be careful here not to figure this out. We don't want to put anybody out of business, do we? Listen, I'm going to tell you, what you don't want to do is bankrupt your family. People today live isolated, lonely lives. True Christianity reduces, uh, uh, true Christianity introduces Jesus as the relational answer to human deficiency. Do you understand the value of what I'm saying? Jesus didn't come so you could be religious. Jesus didn't die so you could merely go to church. If going to church from time to time as a priority because you're a Christian is kind of the essence of your faith and your relationship with God, then you might step back and really evaluate what your relationship with God is truly all about. Because Jesus didn't die so we could go to church. Jesus died so we could be the church. And when we learn to be the church, we actually love the people around us and get it. We don't slip in late and cut out early and try not to make any, you know, eye con don't, don't make any eye contact, kids. Just walk right out and get to the car. You know, we got to get to lunch. And I mean, come on, pause for a moment. 
You don't want them to steal your soul. Don't look in their eyes. (laughs) I'm talking about basic relational hospitality. Basic relational hospitality. This is a crazy statement, but it's absolutely true. And here I am as a preacher standing in a pulpit, preaching to a congregation, about to make this statement to you. Our city will be transformed by Christian hospitality long before it will be transformed by preachers preaching sermons in congregational gatherings. The value of a sermon that I have to preach is only valued if it is embraced and expressed because you are the ministry team for this city. You've got to understand that you are the, I'm not the ministry team for the city. You are the ministry team for the city. People that have been entrusted to your care need to see the love and the life of Jesus Christ and the way you love, serve, and give in your everyday life. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 13 says, do not just pretend that you love others. Really love them. Get into the habit of inviting guests home for dinner. Isn't it interesting that the ministry of the home is something God actually calls us to in our relationships with each other, to take those relationships to a deeper sense of ministry, a deeper sense of connection, a deeper sense of community? Following Jesus' Jesus example will require us to welcome people personally into our lives and into our homes. It just... That's just the way Jesus was, and how many of you know he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Therefore, that's just the way Jesus is, and that's just the way Jesus is going to be. How many of you know if society even dumbs down more and becomes even less intimate and relational? God doesn't change, and all that does is create a greater vacuum in society for a revival move of God born in the heart of people who understand a true revelation of Christ and live that out on a daily basis as the answer to what many are longing for in their lives. The table of the Lord. This was pretty important to Jesus. He invited his friends to eat at the table. Anyone ever seen that picture, that famous picture of Jesus at the table, right? The Lord's Supper. He's always inviting his friends to a table. In fact, Jesus was under scrutiny because he not only ate with his friends and the people who believed the way he did, but Jesus actually ate with sinners. Ooh. Like, people that don't believe the same way maybe you do, actually being around the table with them, not because you have a religious agenda to try and convert them, but because you just care about who they are. Our job is not to change anybody. Our job is to love everybody. And if we'll stop feeling the sense of compulsion that we have to change everybody that comes within our religious reach, we actually will be able to alleviate all that pressure and just love people for who they are. What they do with that love is between them and God. Come on, it's not your obligation. You're going to love more freely if you can get this. After Jesus rose from the grave, we see him having a meal with his friends. Jesus invites us through his broken body, through his shed blood, to the table of God, to have a meal with God as friends, where we become family together through the broken body and shed blood of Christ. In the beginning, isn't it interesting in the beginning that the whole situation was ruined and the fall of humanity actually occurred as the result of a meal that was eaten without God? Isn't it interesting that in the end, there will be another meal? It's called the wedding supper of the Lamb after Jesus comes back. God is all about the party. He is all about the table. He's all about communion. He's all about connection. God is not a prude, and he wants you to flourish and come to life. And that happens when you learn how to live in communion and community and connection, and you stop making excuses that you're just too busy to get connected. If you're too busy for people, you're too busy. We all need to make room for relationships as our highest priority. And if you'll think about this, it's such a great concept, and I've reflected on this so much. Think about how big is God? Like, he's big. (laughs) He is so amazing. 
God's greatest impact on humanity. God's greatest impact on humanity happened in the smallest expression of God known to humanity. God became man. Do you understand these small expressions of kindness where we just pause to interact with somebody on a level that we can identify with them becomes the greatest and most profound expression of your life and ministry? Stop making this some big, huge thing when it's not. It's simply the willingness to be in relationship with somebody because you actually care about them regardless of what the you know, agenda may be. Just lay all that stuff down and just be willing to make room for relationship. I'm just going to say it this way. Your greatest ministry will always happen on the smallest level. It'll always happen on the, your greatest ministry. I, I heard a pastor who retired and after you know, years and years of preaching, I don't know how many sermons I've preached, but I've preached a lot of sermons. You all listen to me talk a lot. We've got a great teaching team. You hear a lot of sermons here. And, and there's going to be a day that I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to say, hey, folks, this is my last sermon to preach. And this particular guy is not today. Uh, some of you were, were, were suddenly hopeful. Is this the day, Lord? Uh, but that's not today. But this pastor came to the conclusion of his tenure as a teaching pastor at his church, and he stood up after 40 plus years of ministry, and he said, uh, you know, this was it. And, and he kind of pondered what people would say, because at the conclusion of the service, they, they positioned him, and people came by, and, and he, he thought, they're going to say, Pastor, I just want you to know, when you preached out of the book of James, it rocked my soul. It was so, your preaching, your teaching is so insightful. It's profound how God himself reveals his revelation through you. I mean, he had kind of prepared, you know, for all these accolades of conversation. Not one single accolade, not one single comment. This is a true story of a pastor who shared this. Not one single interaction about the broadness and the vastness of his ministry. All appreciation was voiced. Thank you that you were there for me when I lost my child. Thank you that you were there for me when I walked through being married, when I walked through um, you know, funerals, or thank you for coming over to my house in that moment when we needed just to hear your voice. As our, you understand, your greatest ministry will always happen on your smallest level. Stop trying to make this into something huge that you're just, you know, I can't do that. Stop trying to do that and just be you right on the level of where you are. This is a, uh, an inspiring and heartbreaking video that I want you to watch, and it's an expression to help us understand truly the value of relationship. Zach can't stop writing lyrics. There are so many songs he wants to leave behind with only months to live. His song called Clouds was born. I fell down, down, down to this dark and lonely hole. There was no one there to care about me anymore. My name is Zach Soviak. I'm 17 years old and I've asked you sarcoma. I've been told I have a few months to live, but I still have a lot of work to do. I want everyone to know you don't have to find out you're dying to start living. They went in and found out that it was cancer. It was osteosarcoma. And it was so unbelievable, honestly. I was um, upstairs in the kitchen. And I just went upstairs and I cried. And I just said, I gotta live life <clears throat> like, well, Zach's gonna die tomorrow. Be someone that you can trust is gonna be smiling the next day, despite his condition. He's kind of just like a, a light in the school. If I have a bad day, it's not actually really a, right, a bad really day. And if I'm complaining day. about something, it just, it's all about perspective, I think. It's really simple, actually. It's just try and make people happy. 
Maybe you have to learn it with time, maybe you have to learn it the hard way, but as long as you learn it, you're gonna make the world a better place. I think that's actually one of the blessings of cancer is that you kind of come out of denial. And so in doing that, things are better. You know, that, that life is richer. Everything means more. Beauty is more beautiful. He's a beautiful person. And I'm so happy to have been Zach Soviak's mom. Just such a challenging thought. I just can't tell you the number of times that Tracy and I have um, found out somebody was moving or, you know, suddenly we realize the dynamic is shifting and we start talking about, man, I wish we had invested more time, whatever. You know, that regret is a terrible price to pay when you have somebody with you and then suddenly in this scenario that person no longer is with you and the beautiful thing is you don't have to live your life preparing for regret if you'll just learn to make the most of every moment that you have I mean you know life is not about having the most of what you want Got a great car, got a great house, we travel. Whatever it is you want. Life's not about having great fashion. Oh, I love shopping. Life's not about having the most of what you want. Life is about making the most of what you have. And God's entrusted something really beautiful to us as a church family. It's the number one thing people say when they come here. It's outrageous how nice everybody is. I feel assaulted with kindness, one person said. Another guy said, I walk into the bathroom, I'm standing at the urinal. Somebody comes up and talks to me. There is a line, folks. There's a man rule. You need to understand. Last blank. Purposing inconvenience for the sake of relationship is community. Purposing inconvenience for the sake of relationship is community. Not dwelling on the price you have to pay to deal with something or to, to be involved in this or to be, you know, somebody relationship demand. No, no. Purposing inconvenience as an expression of worship to the Lord for the sake of relationship is community. So what we do is we bring God's presence to real life. We as a church family come together, we experience God's presence in a wonderful way, and then we walk that out and we bring God's presence to real life. And so this week, I wanna ask you your God's presence to real life action point is to sacrificially invest in someone's life this week so that you can demonstrate God's love to them. So why don't you stand? I just wanna commission you to that as your commission, and then we're gonna receive communion together as a family. So I just commission you, Destiny family, this week will be a week for all of us, each of us, to realize on the smallest level of compassion and consideration and kindness, we will search for ways to sacrificially invest in another person's life over the course of the week so that we can demonstrate God's love to them. Lord, we just receive that commission that we would understand the great commission is not y'all come to church. The Great Commission is y'all go love the world. For God so loved the world that he sent his son to awaken sons and daughters in the earth so he could send more sons and daughters because he loves the world. And I pray, Lord, that would be our mandate over the course of this week in Jesus' name. Just with your eyes closed, if you're here and you say, you know, I am not a Christian. I, I'm not serving Jesus. I'm not even sure. Maybe you've prayed a prayer. You say, I'm not even sure that I'm where I need to be as a Christian. Maybe you've never prayed that prayer. Either way, you say, I know I'm not where I need to be in my relationship with Christ. Just slip up your hand if that's you. I want to pray for you before we go on. Anybody at all? Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Anybody else? Just quickly. 
just a moment of honesty if you say you know I really love the Lord but man the church whew, sometimes the church is hard to deal with if you're here you say yeah, honestly I've allowed myself to step back and not really be involved in God's family the way God wants me to maybe you've never stepped into that but you just want to acknowledge that before God and allow him to lead you through that. Would you slip up your hand? I just want to agree for you, your relationship with the church. Yeah, hands all over. Thank you, thank you. I just want to go deeper in what God's plan is for my relationship with the family. So come on, let's pray this prayer together. Everybody just say this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, you came, you lived, you died, but you're alive. I accept you're my Savior. I need you to rescue me today from all of my sins and redeem my life. Help me to grow in my relationship with you and I'm a re in my relationship with your family as a part of this church. In Jesus' mighty name.